Well, let, let, let me just um, extend my thanks to, to Mark for coming along and, and putting his head in the lion's den and debating with us today. Very, very welcome. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to go soft on him. Um, look, what's the situation we face? Um, let's just, a uh, general picture. Uh, across Europe, um, the old political order is cracking. It's not just that polarisation is evident, it's accelerating. The racist right is not just growing, but it, it's radicalising. It, it's increasingly willing to work with fascists, sometimes in the same organisations like the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. And uh, given, and this is one of the great drivers of this uh, political turmoil, the, uh, what should we say, desperate state of social democracy across Europe, where you have parties like the Dutch, the French, the Greek, of course, social democratic parties, you know, frequent occupiers of ministerial offices, sometimes over decades, almost electorally disappearing. And even where that fate, say, by the German Social Democratic Party or the Italian uh, Democratic Party has been avoided, they're often plummeting to some of their worst results in their history. And in that context, I think that you, you cannot fail to recognise and welcome the fact that Jeremy Corbyn's dramatic and let's be honest, unexpected rise to the leadership of the Labour Party um, and its vindication of its claims that socialist ideas can have a mass appeal in society, what we saw at the general election with an extra three and a half million votes uh, for Labour, um, has altered the British political landscape. I mean, not least because that narrow, stultifying, pro-market consensus at the top of the British society that excluded and made invisible... Uh, all those, you know, the anger and bitterness over privatisation, austerity, uh, inequality, that we knew was there but had no visible expression, has suddenly burst through um, and made the left much more confident. And the fact that hundreds of thousands of people have entered the Labour Party, we now have a situation in Britain where, you know, the number of organised socialists, predominantly in the Labour Party, is nonetheless at its greatest for two or three decades. Um, socialism is back as a current in British society because of what we've seen around Labour. Now, I, I think uh, only a fool would fail to recognise that something very significant has happened here. But the question that I want to address is this. How can that desire for a, a challenge to austerity, war and racism that's embodied in the hopes placed on Jeremy Corbyn has been the big driver of his uh, rise to the Labour leadership, be realised, be, be acted on, be delivered. Um, I mean, Mark Perryman, in many ways, represents the dominant answer to that question. I mean, Mark, my understanding, was not a member of the Labour Party, uh, has now decided to join the Labour Party, uh, and as he puts it in the book that he's edited, The Corbyn Effect, in his introduction, says... And this is what large numbers of people have thought. To affect the change Corbyn now represented, there was simply nowhere else to go. You've got to be in the Labour Party if you want to follow through on this. Now, I want to differ. Um, and that, in some ways, the onus is on, on me and people who think like me to put forward uh, an explanation of why we differ. Um, firstly, because I think that turning the promise, the promissory note that Corbyn, Corbynism represents into real advances requires and depends on translating that into advances outside Labour in the real struggles of working-class people. And to me, doing that will depend on going beyond the prioritisation and focus on uh, electoral activity, which I think, despite the calls for elections to be combined with social movement activism, is still the dominant focus of most of what you might call the new Labour left that's emerged uh, around Corbyn. And a bigger, stronger revolutionary socialist organisation outside the Labour Party can increase the prospects of that promise turning into reality and real, real change. Now, now, why do I say that? How do I justify it? Um, I just want to touch quickly on four areas, if I can. Firstly, because, uh, you know, the battle to shape the future of British society and British politics is taking place now. Um, and... Uh, I think we have to acknowledge that particularly Labour's huge advance at the general election has a double-edged nature to it. It's both given the left much more confidence and shifted the ideological debate in society, but it has also created, as everyone acknowledges, that feeling that suddenly Labour is a government in waiting. <coughs> and that, especially, especially given the difficulties we face at the level of struggle, which is not nearly as high as we want to see, creates 
a feeling of waiting for Labour. That the answer, if you want to defend the NHS or, or pay rise or blunt austerity and reverse it and so on, <laughs> is it our road of struggle and resistance and so on, or is it just get Jeremy elected? And we need to win this by-election, we need to win these council elections in order to advance that cause. But let's be clear, uh, even on its own terms, there is no guarantee, I think it would be very foolish to say there's a guarantee that Labour will simply win the next uh, election. There's no guarantee the Tories will simply uh, collapse. On the contrary, one of the points I would want to make is if we saw a much higher level of struggle, say, in defence of the NHS, if the NHS pay deal had been turned into a rallying cause, not just for a higher pay rise, but for dents the NHS, not only had, would that increase the prospects of winning gains now to ameliorate the problems, it would also create a much greater sense of class feeling and combativity in society who will benefit from that? It means the core of the Corbynite movement would influence more of the people around it and pull them in and would increase Labour's vote. There is a link between Labour's vote and class struggle in that sense. And the converse is also true. The more people are left at home passively, the more the influence of ruling class ideas and the divisions that it promotes have on people. In other words, the people who stand between us on the one hand and are influenced by the ideas that passivity influences ruling class ideas and so on and pulls up and it increases the weakness and the problems that Labour may face. Um, and obviously the attacks that we're facing, we can't wait for 2022. We need more struggle. Uh, the problem we face, as I said, is there's far too little. I mean, uh, Mark in his books does put the argument that Labour must become, in his words, a social movement as well as an election winning force. I can't help noticing that the book ends, however, by a very detailed description of the 66 key marginal seats that Labour needs to win. In other words, there's talk of social movement activism, but the focus, in the end, is an electoral uh, project, and that's where activists should push, pitch their energy. In other words, it's very easy to say we need parliamentary activity and extra parliamentary. In the real world, we all have to make choices about what the priority is, and Labour's push is towards uh, elections. I think, on the contrary, we need more things like we saw with the university lecturers strike against pensions. We need more things like the fantastic victory we've just seen amongst the Wigan NHS workers. We need more things like the Kirklees bin workers who've just said they'll go on all-out strike from the end of July. And we have to have an organisation that doesn't simply call for that. I mean, John and, uh, you know, John McDonald, Jeremy Corbyn would say that probably too, actually. It's very welcome. But the aim of a, a, a socialist organisation like the SNP is to systematically try to increase the level of struggle by pulling together militants, acting to support and fight for solidarity for any struggle, and to, where possible, lead struggle, but not just as individuals, but as part of the pooled experience of a socialist organisation, maximising the chance of increasing the level uh, of struggle. Secondly, we have a very serious problem. Britain is not immune from this polarisation. We now face a very serious threat, in my view, of a resurgence of the far right, the 15,000 people who gathered around the Free Tommy uh, demonstration in London a few weeks ago. In other words, the rise of Corbyn doesn't preclude simultaneously the resurgence of the far right in Britain. Both are happening at the same time. And I think it's not enough to simply counterpose the expanded left's army that we assembled around Corbyn with that movement. It's not enough simply to mobilise on the 13th against Trump or to mobilise in Durham on the 14th. You have to directly challenge the fascists, directly challenge uh, racist ideas if you want to defeat them. Um, and whether that's the anti-Nazi league or United Against Fascism or Stand Up to Get Fascism, revolutionary socialist organisation like the SDP, has always played a key role in building that kind uh, of movement, and that's a necessary and crucial task today. Thirdly, and again, I think we have to be honest and not just dismiss this, the pressures that exist on Corbyn to moderate, to retreat from boldness, exist. They're not all dominant, but they exist. And I think they have strengthened by that idea that Downing Street is almost within uh, the grasp of Labour. For example, I think it is a retreat for Labour's position on the freedom of movement of EU nationals to be simply to say, when Britain leaves the EU, free movement will end. Why can't Labour say, when, it end, when Labour gets into office, it will reinstate free movement for EU nationals, inside or outside the EU? It should say that, because anything else gives concession to the idea that EU nationals are somehow something that undermine wages and so on and so forth. I think it's a problem... 
And it's clearly not Jeremy Corbyn's personal belief that Labour accepts the Trident Renewal Programme and, and the 800, sorry, £100 billion price tag that goes along with it. That is a concession. Um, I think it is a problem uh, that not a single one of the right-wing Labour MPs who constantly seek to undermine Corbyn has been deselected, reselected, as Mark calls it. But nonetheless, not a single one of them has been leaving effectively a fifth column inside the Labour Party should it reach government, who may not respect key parts of the manifesto, even in parliamentary uh, terms. I think it is a problem. It's the kind of two souls of uh, John McDonald. He's on picket lines. Thank you. But he also says we should appeal to business, that Labour will introduce, for example, high-tech investment that business will benefit from. It's an, an attempt to say, we're not a threat. We can work with you. We can deliver Brexit more successfully than the divided Tories. Of course, business will like this, as long as they don't have to pay for any of this. And the conditions of it will be that you still pursue the interests of, of, uh, of big business and neoliberalism and so on. And the idea that simply increasing business's profits will trickle down to the rest of us, well, we've had a 30-year experiment in this. We, we ought to be uh, quite suspicious. And I think that the way in which, I think, in the last... Uh, few months, Labour has often been too cautious and limited its mobilisations, has allowed a shell-shocked right after the general election, shocked by Corbyn's rise, to begin to regroup, and on the question of cl ridiculous claims that Labour is somehow rife with anti-Semitism, that Corbyn is a poster boy for all this and all this stuff, there was a degree of paralysis inside the Labour Party, and a lack of clarity and mobilisation against it. In other words, as the establishment strikes back, there's a danger that Labour doesn't know how to respond. And this will intensify. And this is my last point. Because really, at the heart of Labour, it's a very simple proposition, as there always been, that the key to change in society is number 10 Downing Street. This raises a very fundamental question about where does power lie in society? Is it simply in the existing institutions of liberal democracy, a government elected with a popular mandate and introduces change? Now, I think we can't simply wave away the record here. And you don't need to go to the history books. Well, you should read the history books, uh, uh, of course. But look, at, it's almost three years to the day that the radical left government in Syriza, which was elected on a programme not wildly different from what we saw in Labour's manifesto, was confronted by the European Union and the IMF and capitulated and drove through uh, austerity. And I think it's not good enough to either just skate over that in an embarrassed silence or to say Britain isn't Greece. Britain doesn't apply. Of course Britain's not Greece. In Britain, we're up against a much, much more powerful ruling class. Do we think these people, British big business, will simply respect a democratic mandate? You know, you know will the CEOs of Britain, will the Murdochs and so on, simply say, well, well done, Jeremy, you've won the argument, I disagree with you, I'll get my checkbook out, how much more tax am I paying? They will seek to limit, curb, and undermine. They will have gone on investment strikes, capital flight, work with senior civils. We know this is what they will do. And, and here, I think, the difficulty is this. You can't apply an ahistorical approach. History is not like a buffet meal at a restaurant where you can, out of your subjective desire, decide, do we want to be a 1945 government or a new Labour government? Do we want to be Nye Bevan or Tony Blair? It's the historical conditions that shakes it. And we are not living in an era of wartime boom and the post-war golden era. We are living in a much more crisis-wrapped era of capitalism, and they will fight tooth and nail to make sure that we pay the price. This is what austerity is. The burden of the crisis is put on our shoulders. This will not change because the government changes. And therefore, to, to win reforms will require, and we have to be honest with people, much more than a vote, it will require mass class confrontations. Even to make these people pay their tax, I mean, John McDonald talks about tax, will require class confrontation. Massive class confrontation uh, with their side. Um, in other words, uh, we have to arm people for the fact that we do not live in a democracy, that there are huge centres of unelected concentrations of economic power, and they will have to be uh, challenged. Now, it's probably time to sum up, so let me just say, say this in the end. What's the alternative I'm arguing for here? It's not that we should go around telling Corbyn supporters that they're fools for believing in this and denounce people, or just issue abstract calls day in, day out for revolution. It's to say, we want the same as you, but we think we have to start the fight and organise now, including not just the fight over economic questions, but the fight against all the forms of oppression that divide working class people to fight for unity, and that the fate of a Corbyn government will not, in the end, be decided inside the Labour Party or even inside Parliament, but by a clash of extra-parliamentary forces between our class and their class. And that, therefore, 
The most effective way to increase the possibility of winning that clash, firstly, is for socialists to organise independently of the right, which leads to a the constant internal focus, paralysis, pressure for unity. Because by organising independently in a separate organisation, we maximise our chance of being uncompromising on all the key questions and key principles of the class struggle, but simultaneously, not to isolate ourselves, but to seek the maximum unity with people who want to fight the far right or fight to defend the NHS or on a whole host of questions. It's not for sectarian isolation. Um, because we want to encourage and increase and expand our collective power and organisation, not only because that's the best way to win games in the here and now, but because in those struggles far more than in elections, working people change. If you look at the strike in Wigan, don't tell me that the people who take taken part in that are the same as they were two months ago in terms of their sense of collective power, collective organisation, creativity, people, people discovering they can speak at meetings in front of 800 people. This transforms people. In other words, the road to socialism will not come through even hundreds of the best MPs, if they're all like Corbyn, with huge enthusiastic support. The road to socialism ultimately will come through the struggles from below of ordinary working people who in the process of fighting will transform themselves. And therefore, if we want to deliver those promises we see around Corbyn, we need to move beyond electoralism in order to, uh, and promote the maximum level of working class uh, self-activity. Thank you. Okay, um, Mark uh, said he welcomed me to the lion's den. As some of you might know, I'm a big area of my activism, a big area of my politics is football. So I'd like to thank you for saving me from the lion's den today, because in 2002 I was in Shizuoka, where Ronaldinho ruined football coming home. And in 2006 I was in Gelsenkirchen, where Rooney getting sent off and Ronaldo's wink ensured that the Lions didn't bring, the free Lions didn't bring football home then either. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, what, I, what I start off with is exploring some of the terrain of the debate, because I don't regard this as a clash of ideas. I regard this as a mixing of minds and different emphases, and maybe beginning to get an inkling, I've certainly got, I mean, I. I've been to Marxism before, I think I've got quite a good inkling of, of what the SWP is about, and maybe to give a bit of an inkling about what it's about, why people in their hundreds of thousands have been drawn into the Labour Party. So by way of explanation, if asked the question, I am not, nor have I ever been, a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, or a supporter, and those of you who know my writing and activism, I have on occasion been a critic, Quite a sharp critic, but I hope a friendly and non-sectarian critic. I've been to Marxisms, like I said. Uh, I went to one many years ago with the historian Geoffrey Foote speaking. And I think he was talking about the history of the Labour Party. And in his uh, response to the questions, he said, this feels like, I think we should change the title of the meeting, he said, this feels like the meeting seats to recruit the speaker. <laughs> um, now, I would suggest you don't go there with me, and nor am I here to recruit you into the Labour Party or to persuade you to leave your organisation. I think that's a fruitless and, to be honest, rather patronising uh, waste of the next 15 minutes or so. Joking apart in terms of ripping me away from uh, England's uh, quarter-final, I owe, like hundreds of thousands of people, a debt of gratitude to the Socialist Workers' Party, a huge debt of gratitude. I wouldn't be the person with the politics I have now without the Socialist, per Socialist Workers' Party, because 40 years ago, I went straight out of Tadworth in North Surrey in the stockbroker belt with a group of lower six formers, and we made our way to Victoria Park. 
And I discovered in that day that politics was about drinking beer, which you weren't supposed to drink, standing next to men who kissed one another. It was a much more multicultural space than you would ever experience in Tadworth, North Surrey. You could see the clash, the X-ray specs, Tom Robinson still pulse for free. And most importantly, politics could be fun. And that changed my life. And I would say for another generation, the Stop the War demo on the 15th of February 2003. Let's be absolutely clear, these movements wouldn't have taken place without the staffing and organisation and, if you like, the vertebrae of activism which the SWP provided. In an earlier era, we're talking, I think you've been talking quite a lot about the 50th anniversary of 68, I think you'd be generous enough to say that the role of the International Marxist Group was pretty central in 1968, in this country, at any rate. Or if we fast forward, I think you would be generous enough to say, in terms of the anti-poll tax movement, the militant tendency played a crucial role. If you want to go back to the 70s and the huge miners strikes of 72 and 74, the Communist Party was absolutely central to that. Whatever your differences with the Communist Party on Russia or the Soviet Union or whatever, it's pretty central to those movements. So it would be a fall not to recognise the role of, I think, what Mark described as the independent left outside of the Labour Party. And that remains true today. It will remain true in the next four or five years until a general election, and it will no doubt tr remain true after that. Now, with, the, uh, with Sophie's uh, permission, I'd like to ask a couple of audience participation questions, because I think it will help the terrain of the debate. I'd just like to show, see a show of hands who in this room is a member of the Labour Party. OK, so that's, that's quite a decent number. I don't know whether that's more or less than previous Marxists, but it looks like maybe around about a third of the audience. OK. Should, and I absolutely agree, by the way, in your speech and Charlie Kimber's speech this morning, it's, it's not a done deal that Jeremy Corbyn will enter number 10. And actually, I don't think there are very many people in the Labour Party who believe it's a done deal, particularly after the recent local elections and the state of the polls and Brexit to come. But should Jeremy Corbyn enter, enter number 10, leading a Labour government, could we see a show of hands? How many people, I'm not asking on a scale of 1 to 10, how many people will be happy that day? <laughs> OK, I think, I think we've got unanimity. Is that a first for Marxism, to have a unanimous, <laughs> particularly to a guest speaker? So, that's what I mean. It's not a battle of ideas, it's a meeting of minds and an exploration of different priorities I think we're talking about today. Now, I think I'm right in saying that Jeremy Corbyn has in the past been a regular speaker at Marxism. Let's be honest, he didn't, didn't used to get the top Saturday or Sunday billing. He used to get, I think he used to get the, uh, the uh, doomsday spot of, of a Sunday morning, if I remember correctly, <laughs> which gives you an idea of the magnitude of his winning of the Labour leadership. So Jeremy has in the past been a speaker at Marxism. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't think he's going to be a speaker here in the ne uh, next few years. But he is not and never has been a revolutionary socialist. So let's be absolutely clear. If you're going to judge him on the criteria of revolutionary socialism, he's going to fall short. That's absolutely clear. So we need to move on from that. But Jeremy is surely different to Ed Miliband, is surely different to Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, um, John Smith, Neil Kinnock, Michael Foote, Harold, uh, James Callaghan, and um, Harold Wilson, you know, the Labour Prime Ministers that I can remember and have experienced. And that was summed up for me in the 2015 opposition leaders debate, when they had the leaders of the opposition parties um, Ed Miliband, Plaid, UKIP, uh, the SNP, the Greens. And the three, three women leaders, Natalie Bennett from the Greens, uh, Leanne Wood from Plaid, Nicola Sturgeon from the SNP, were laying into Ed Miliband over and over again for being too far on the right. And Ed Miliband turns around at once, feeling a bit exasperated, and said, oh, come on, I'm not the same as the Tories. And Nicola Sturgeon, who is an extremely good debater, turns around quick as a flash and says, no, you're not the same, Ed, but you're not different enough. Now, I think what we should recognise, it no debater would ever be able to say that about Jeremy Corbyn. He is significantly different 
to those past Labour leaders. He may not be different enough for the Socialist Workers' Party, but he's different enough for British politics. Hence, my contention is that a general election, which, despite the best efforts of you and many other activists, I do believe will be in 2022, won't be much any sooner, and I'll explain why if you want. But when that moment comes, this will be a general election of historic proportions, which we will put aside 45 and 79. And why do I choose those two dates? Because in 45, Attlee establishes the post-war consensus. And I know, as revolutionary socialists, you'd have criticisms of the post-war consensus, but why, for goodness sake, do we march and celebrate the 70th anniversary of the National Health Service if it doesn't mean diddly squat? Okay, so it meant something. It changed the face of British politics, and it remained in place more or less till 79. And what 79 did, 5th of May 79, is it not overnight, but gradually introduced Thatcherism, or as we more familiar term now, a neoliberal consensus, which Blair, Brown, Cameron, and May have left intact. And at the very least, Jeremy Corbyn will break that consensus. So that's why 45, 79, 2022, or whenever it is, is very important. And Charlie Kimber put it, I thought, very well this morning in your nine words. These are urgent times. These are times for action. Absolutely correct. And there's been a number of comments about Trident. If this was a Labour Party meeting, I'd also ask for a show of hands. And more than two-thirds of Labour members, whenever I do this at Labour Party meetings, put up their hand, yet yeah, they don't want Trident in the next manifesto. So please don't underestimate there is a battle around that. There is a huge concern. And the big block we have, let's be absolutely clear, is the GMB and Unite. Because they see the jobs that they have in the armed industry, including in the nuclear arms industry, as sacrosanct. And they seem to have entirely forgotten the heritage of socially useful production, the Lucas Aerospace Plan, and so on. But even worse than that in lots of ways, because even with, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn at number 10, I don't think we're going to be launching Trident missiles at anybody. But we have got the threat of climate change. And 119 Labour MPs voted for the third runway. Well, as it's been neatly put by better writers than me, it's not much point having a job if your climate is dead. And there is going to be a huge battle over sustainable economics and where that features in the next manifesto. So this is a turning point of sorts, and it's a turning point of opportunities. Now, the SWP is an organisation whose philosophy was founded, I, don't, I think it may be a few more than nine words, on the brilliant slogan, neither Washington nor Moscow, but international socialism. And if I could sort of bastardise that slogan for a moment, is I think what we're talking about now is, is the emphasis labour on the doorstep, i.e. knocking on the doors, getting the vote out, or is the emphasis, as I rather waggishly put it, planet placard? And what I would say is we need both. And sometimes the emphasis will be more on labour on the doorstep, and sometimes the emphasis will be more on the demonstrations like next Friday and Saturday. And I think there are members of the SWP, you know, in the recent past, have been involved in electoral politics, particularly in respect and the Socialist Alliance and the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. So you understand but sometimes you change your emphases and priorities. Please respect the fact that, for instance, the UCU dispute has been mentioned. The Sussex University picket lines were visited by uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle, MP for Kemp Town, which is where, which is within the constituency. Many members of the Labour Party went down to those picket lines. We had speakers at Labour Party branch and CLP meetings and so on. So, you know, these two worlds are not hermetically sealed. And I guess what you want to do is push a few more of us off the uh, doorstep. What I want to do is to push a few more of you off the demos and come and join us on the doorstep. What might this mix, if you like, begin to look like? Well, because I'm of a certain age, I do tend to look back at the 80s. It was a kind of heyday for me, politically, despite everything that was going wrong at the time in terms of age and activism and so on. Um, 
And Gary Young put this really well, you know, a peerless writer uh, at the beginning of the um, Corbyn phenomenon. If this really were a return to the 80s, as some suggest, then we would, he would have a peace, he being Corbyn, would have a peace movement making his case for him against war and a vibrant trade union movement making the case against austerity. As it does, as it, as it is, he doesn't even have a party he can rely on. Now, he was writing those words in 2015 when Corbyn had just won the Labour leadership. That's what's changed. That's what's changed since the 8th of June 2017. No, people in the Labour Party don't believe the next general election is in the bag. No, not at all. But they do believe a victory is possible. And I must admit, you know, in Gramsci's famous maxim, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, you know, in the build-up to June, I was more of a pessimistic rather than the optimistic side. Um, and the gestation of this book, basically this book, uh, I'm the editor, by the way, not, not the author, uh, although as editor I get to write the longest essay, um, <laughs> began in September 2016. Jeremy's just won the um, leadership election for the second time. There seemed to be a total lack of really thoughtful, deep understanding of what was going on. You tended to be described as cultists or thugs, yeah, um, thugs or members of a fan club. And I thought, no, there's got to be something more substantive to say about Corbyn. And the book was commissioned, and I told people to get their chapters in in early January, and then two by-elections were called, if you remember, Stoke Central and Copeland, and the predictions were that Labour would lose both. So I write to all the contributors, written their final drafts, end of January, and say, look, put it on hold, we'll see how the by-elections go. Well, if you remember, Labour loses Copeland, a seat where the, the vote under Jack Cunningham in particular had been in freefall for a number of years, and just about holds on to Stoke Central to see off the UKIP threat. Get back to all the contributors say, look, OK, I think we've got a book, but I want to change the title, The Corbyn Effect and Labour's Existential Crisis. And you've all got to write an extra 100, 200, 300 words with the word crisis in it. Yeah, that, OK, that'll work. And then, what is it, 18th of April, Theresa May calls a snap general election. Well... No book, you know. Labour's clear, clearly going to lose heavily. This is the pessimism of the intellect. Uh, Labour's clearly going to lose heavily. Uh, Corbyn will be forced to resign. There'll be a third summer of a Labour leadership election. Who wants to read a book about the effect of the ex-Labour leader? June the 8th. I spent the day with my nine-year-old um, canvassing uh, and getting the vote out in Morscombe on a really working class in uh, estate on the edge of Brighton. And it seems to be going pretty well, but I'm thinking, yeah, okay, maybe we might win the odd, odd margin. Or there does seem to be a lot of people out, a lot, a huge amount of activism. Uh, I live just round the corner from my constituency office in Lewis in East Sussex, and I think, well, I'll. Stay up for the exit poll, watch it online, it's probably not going to be that interesting, and uh, then go to bed and get up in the morning and just write to all the contributors and say, sorry, you know, the book's off. At uh, about midnight, uh, no, sorry, at 10, the, ele the exit poll comes in, I jog round to the constituency office, about two o'clock in the morning, the result comes in from Kemp Town, Kemp Town in Brighton, the constituency where I've been working. Lloyd Russell Moyle was fighting a, lay, a Tory marginal. The Tory majority was around about 800 votes. UKIP had stood down, so we think, OK, all the UKIP votes are going to go to the Tories. Greens have stood down in favour of Labour. Well, we get a few hundred of those. <sighs> the result comes through. Lloyd Russell Moyle, Labour, 10,000 majority. Fuck. <laughs> Sorry, that's a technical publishing term. Um, Charlie will be familiar with that as editor of a newspaper. Next morning, I get up at the crack of dawn, write to all the uh, contributors. A couple of them, their, their chapters don't quite work anymore. I say, OK, you've got to rewrite. The only way it's going to work, we get it out in time for Labour Party conference, and the rest is publishing history. What would this mix of minds rather than clash of ideas look like? Well, I'd start with Rock Against Racism. Rock Against Racism would have been impossible without the SWP, but it created a culture much, much bigger than the SWP. It created a culture of resistance and fun, uh, which had, the like of which none of us had ever seen before. And Paul Gilroy, 
put it brilliantly, unruly opposition was given creative expression, not just in the musical cross-fertilisation that came from a founding commitment, in which black and white bands always shared audiences and performance space, but in the visual excesses of Rock Against Racism. And I don't want to tread on delicate toes, but as I understand the history of the SWP, it didn't grow particularly out of Rock Against Racism, didn't grow particularly out of Stop the War. Uh, I'm sure you picked up hundreds of members, but not thousands. Um, but the contribution that the SWP made by, in those two particular movements will go down in history, will go down in history of this country. And the other one, I, I'm very close to summing up, is it's, it's a Pride March today. In 1986, that march was led by miners. You know, the film Pride isn't a piece of fiction, it's a piece of labour history. And the kind of solidarity which your party played a role in, but many other forces did, Let, let's be clear and honest about that, was extraordinary. Now, uh, I know enough, I think, about SWP history and theory, but the, this, there's this phrase, the downturn. Well, I don't think we're going to get my, the miners leading uh, this year or next year's pride. You know, we're not living through a downturn. We're living through something which is more subterranean than that. So we're going to have to look at ways of building resistance. We're all in favour of building a resistance that, that you talked about, but they may going to come in different ways. And so I make no apology with the book finishing with electoralism. There's a very good plug there from Mark. There's we list a list for 66 seats which Labour needs to win to form to be a majority government, not the biggest party to form a majority government. It also lists for 19 defences. Do you know what the number number one defence? That's that means seats with a majority of less than 1,000. There's no point winning 66 if you lose your margin. What's the number one target, marg uh, target defence for one with the lowest majority in the entire country? Kensington, with a majority of 20. I somehow suspect that Emma Dent Code has turned out of tragedy Kensington into a safe seat. Just down the road from here, is cities of London and Westminster. Uh, here's my battered copy of uh, the Guardian edition from the, uh, I think it was from the 10th of June, the Saturday after the election. And I looked up, what I always do when I do these talks, I look, I look up the nearest marginal. Nearest marginal, how ironic is this? Cities of London and Westminster. Just imagine Labour winning cities of London and Westminster, turning that into a Labour seat. It has a Tory majority of 3,148. For Labour to form a majority government, it needs a swing of 3.6%. To win city of cities of London and Westminster, it needs a swing of 4.07%. Win cities of London and Westminster, you are guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed, a majority Labour government. So my question to you is, isn't that a prize worth making happen? My question to you, not today, not next week, not next month, not next year. In the month before the 5th of May 2022, will you give up four weeks of your time to ensure that we win those marginals? Because if we do, whatever your organisation or no organisation, we together will be making history. Uh, Simon Hester from Tottenham uh, in North London in Haringey. Uh, I used to be very active with Mark back in the day with respect. I didn't know you'd moved to Brighton. Um, since you've gone, uh, there's uh, in the last two, three years in Haringey, we've uh, seen the, the effect of the rise of Corbynism in quite a dramatic fashion. Um, and it wasn't just the fact that Corbyn and what he represents is the big uh, socialist alternative, there is an alternative type of politics. His positions on council housing and public services in particular gave a massive boost to housing tenants, uh, council house tenants and others and activists, people like us, in the area fighting the Labour Council, right-wing Labour Council, instituting a massive social cleansing programme uh, called the HDV. And because of the rise of Corbynism and because of the campaign we led, and we were part of, we, we generally, not just SWP members, Labour Party members as well, led against their own party and their own council, that HDV is now dead and is going to be signed off on July the 17th by a new council calling itself the first Corbynista council. 
Uh, and the, it wasn't just that the campaign was inspired by Corbyn and partly was, you know, was very much inspired by Corbyn and what he stood for, but the Labour left in Haringey grew from under 1,000 members to now over 7,500 members. Hornsey Wood Green Labour Party claims to be the biggest Labour Party in the country with over 4,000 members. And in, the pro in January and February of this year, dozens, dozens of Labour, left, Labour right wing councillors were deselected and replaced by left wingers, some of whom joined the party on the day that Corbyn was elected leader. I was speaking to Mike Hakata, a new, new Labour councillor, as we were driving to Calais three weeks ago, and he was explaining to me why he joined the Labour Party. He said, I've been on demonstrations, I've been doing stuff. Uh, and I've been shouting at the television, on the day Corbyn got elected leader, I realised I had to do something, so he joined the Labour Party, and he's now a Labour councillor already. And on Thursday, he was telling me he went to his first training session to be a councillor, and I said, what's that for, to help you toe the line? And he said, yeah, that's exactly what they're trying to do. And he's already coming up into a difficult situation, because this council has made lots of promises, but they still face the same problem. No money, further government cuts, uh, and a real, real difficulty uh, in front of them. Uh, and the, the arguments about what this council is going to do have already started to uh, happen uh, in Haringey. But, it, but this Labour, new Labour council has already made a difference. Just at, the, just at the very basic level, 28 Labour councillors in Haringey have signed a statement calling on a fight against, against the far right and against uh, 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 Donald Trump. They're, meet, they're, going to go, they're going to campaign meetings that we're going to to put the case for what the council is trying to do and listen to activists and so on. It's a completely different uh, picture. The problem, the problem, though, is it's a council with no money and it's a government that's crushing and going to cut even more. There's going to be more cuts and more cuts and more cuts. So what is the council, the Corbyn council, going to do in that situation? And essentially, they have to make the cuts and they know that. When John McDonnell came to a meeting in Haringey of over 300 Labour Party members, they allowed us in, they allowed the SWP in because we've been active with the Labour left. They asked us not to speak and embarrass anybody, uh, but we were there to listen. And, and John McDonald said, if you have to make the cuts, you just have to do it in such a way that you blame the Tories for making those cuts. And if we have to wait to 2022, the experience of left Labour councils, if there are any more, is going to completely undermine the, 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 the strategy uh, uh, and the ability of, of the, of the Labour left and Corbyn in particular to, uh, to propose. Them. Have I got to stop? OK, I wanted to talk about the anti-racist work. We're still working with these people. There's three Labour Party stalls out today campaigning for the demonstration uh, next week. That's really important. Stand up to racism and the movement has to be... We have to win it, the Labour Party to adopt that, and they are where we are, um, and that's a pro, uh, sign of uh, uh, progress and, and a good way forward. Yeah. Uh, all right, John, John Molyneux from Socialist Workers Network and People Before Profit in Ireland. And I just want to uh, say something about the view how, uh, uh, of the Corbyn effect from, from Ireland and ask a couple of real genuine questions that if people can answer them, that would be great. Um, the the uh, first thing I, I was going to say on this is that obviously when we watched from uh, Ireland Corbyn getting elected, it was magnificent. You saw those great rallies uh, uh, and huge turnouts and the fantastic votes. And then you watched the general election, you saw the Corbyn effect, or you saw Glastonbury and people singing, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, and so on. It was, it was marvellous and it was inspiring. But from Dublin, at least, in recent months, he seems to have gone relatively silent. Now, uh, that's a, a view from afar. I'm sure there's stuff going on at some level, and statements and so on, but from a, from a distance, you're not hearing much about what Jeremy is saying about things. And I've got some simple questions. When you've got Trump coming, and you've got a fascist demonstration on Saturday, has Jeremy Corbyn made, for example, a video that you could put on Facebook where he says, I call on all Labour Party members and supporters to turn out against Trump or against the fascists? If he has, I haven't seen it, uh, and I watch these things. But I think it would be great if he did. When there was a National Health Service demonstration, did Jeremy make a video, a public statement, saying, come on, all trade unionists, la Labour Party voters and supporters, we've implemented the NHS, we've fought for it, come and defend it. 
uh, 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 and so on. Because I think it would be fantastic if he would, if, if he would do that. He'd give those demonstrations a tremendous boost. It would make them much, much bigger. And I say that because we're lucky enough in, in Ireland, in people with for-profit, we have some uh, members of parliament, we call them TDs, right? And uh, obviously they don't have the influence that Jeremy has. But I tell you, if we were facing those demonstrations on uh, Friday and Saturday, we would get our TDs, our MPs, to stand up in the parliament facing the Prime Minister, make a speech in which they plug the demonstration, make a speech on uh, uh, YouTube or whatever, a video, and put it up saying, we urge everybody to come out, as we did like with Breed Smith during the repeal campaign, urging everybody to vote, urging everybody to go out and canvass and so on. We would do that. Now, I don't know if that's asking Jeremy Corbyn to be a revolutionary socialist or not. I think it's asking him to build the movement. And um, I don't know, if I'm wrong and he's been doing this and I haven't heard about it, I apologize. But I think he should do it and it would strengthen the movement next week and for the future if he were to do it. So that's my question. Um, feeling a bit conflicted as um, a member of the Labour Party and a member of Momentum, but someone who, like Mark, owes, uh, probably both Marks, owe a lot of political education to the Socialist Workers' Party over a long time, and I can hear Rosa Luxemburg in my head saying, reform and revolution, there isn't a calm path to the same <laughs> goal, and I believe absolutely that the emancipation of the working class has to be the act of the working class, and my hope my conflict is not just autobiographical and is one that other people have come across or are involved in, which is the but. And I think it is about the class struggle. And when Mark talks about the role of the Socialist Workers' Party absolutely in fighting the far right and in generating solidarity and in spreading the message of class struggle and so on where it exists, that is great. The Socialist Workers' Party is not going to dictate the balance of class struggle, is not going to foment general class struggle in society, the kind of struggle that can really change things. And in the absence of that struggle, it's been a long, long time um, since any significant struggle, and that was defeated. And I think this leaves a big gap. I don't think the relationship between struggle and Labour is simple. I think historically often people vote for Labour when they've been defeated when their self-activity has been crushed and they're looking for somebody to do it for them. And to be honest, that's how I feel. Because after years of being a teacher, we have a lovely union, we're very organised, we've had strikes, we've got a left leadership. We've been crushed. Our education system is in tatters. Academies are draining money out. The nursery I work in in a deprived area in Tower Hamlets will be shutting in two or three years' time because the government have cut the money. Now, OK, waiting for Jeremy Corbyn clearly isn't going to be an answer. But at least, and he may be failing on all sorts of other things, but I think over things like education, things like the NHS, my hopes are not to sit back passively and wait. Of course not. We do all the campaigning we can, the big assemblies and so on. But, yeah, you can see my dilemma. I would love it to be class struggle. But is it really going to be? And is Jeremy not at least something that can change something in the short term? <laughs> Uh, Simon already mentioned how in, in Tottenham, in Haringey, we've been working really well with the reinvigorated Labour left, reinvigorated by Corbyn, and the, and the Labour left in Haringey have swept away uh, the blue Labour councillors, and we now we have a new uh, Corbyn Easter Council, which is wonderful. But I think what I want to talk about is the importance of maintaining um, a revolutionary party that has the independent interests of the working class at heart. Because the situation we're in now is in the Stop HDV campaign, uh, we were working alongside the Labour Party. Now we have the new council. And the Stop HDV campaign, a delegation went to meet the new Labour councillor, the new leader of the Labour Council, to talk about now what their ambitious programme is uh, for housing in the borough. And bottom line uh, is they're very constrained as to what they can achieve and they're not delivering on all the promises. They want to, they're full of integrity, they're absolutely committed, but they're constrained by what is achievable. And there was a bit of a debate within the campaign because uh, the Labour Party members in the campaign didn't want to publicise the discussion that we'd had with the, leader of the, the Labour leader of the council. 
because at this stage they didn't want public criticism of this Labour Council. Because, let's face it, we've been working with these people, we're mates, we've been working in the same campaign. All the pressure now is to say, let's have unity, let's give, these new, uh, let's give this new left-wing council a chance, let's subdue any criticism, let's hold fire. But the point that we're making is actually the interests of the working class, they cannot be ditched while we hold fire until we achieve what we want to achieve. Because the Labour Party, by definition, is going to say we have to settle with what's achievable within the existing system. And this is why I'm a revolutionary, because we recognise that actually a decent standard of living for working class people is not achievable within the constraints of the existing system. When austerity is pushing our wages down, is pushing us out of London, is pushing us into a situation where our, our, our grandchildren are not going to face the same opportunities that we have to. So we think absolutely that the... Uh, the Sorry, the, the um, uh, revolutionary change has got to be the, uh, the act of the working class. But how, how do working class people emancipate ourselves? People have to be given opportunities where they can see the limitations of the existing system. We can't pretend that things are hunky-dory. We can't say just wait. We've got to show those limitations now so people can see for themselves, get a taste that change has to come from below. And that's why we're revolutionaries. I've seen some wonderful sights in my life, uh, but up there has to be Stephen Kinnock's face when he saw the exit polls on the day of the election and all of his dreams of kind of usurping Jeremy Corbyn and the left kind of uh, in the tablets. But I thought it was interesting what you said about um, saying that Jeremy uh, Corbyn isn't a uh, revolutionary socialist. Of course not. But he's a socialist. And the millions of people, well, hundreds of thousands of people that joined the Labour Party, the millions of people that uh, kind of uh, supported, uh, voted uh, Labour and supported Labour, I think that they're just as enraged as I am about watching what happened at Grenfell, they're just as enraged as I am uh, about uh, what's happening to our health services and education and so on. Truth of the matter is, we're desperate for change. People are desperate for change. They can't wait. They can't wait till 2022. That, that's just not uh, viable. And in terms of putting the brakes on it, actually, it's not so much the likes of the PLP and the Stephen Kinnock's of this world. I would argue it's actually, you know, you know, I was at the United Conference recently. I, I think it's trade union leadership have got some responsibility. I mean. Lynn McCluskey, this whole conference, big kind of, you know, big warning to the big bosses and so on. We've got a £35 million war chest. Start bloody spending it then. Start kind of organising some action uh, and fight back then. And actually, something that someone that used to come to this conference every year, the founder member of the SWP, Tony Cliff, used to say, said, yeah, there's many roads to socialism. But there's only one bloody socialism. And what he meant was, is actually it's that process of struggle that actually changes people. Cheers. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Max from the International Socialist in uh, the Netherlands. Um, looking from across the channel, the, the rise of Corbyn has been incredible and uh, beyond Britain it has, a, has had an uh, enormous impact and especially if you live in a country where the main opposition party is Geert Wilders' Freedom Party these kind of things give you hope. Um, I, think, I think that's, that, that's really uh, great but it also reminded me of a period in the Netherlands when I became politically active when we had kind of the same Thing. It was the rise of the Socialist Party. Uh, in the Netherlands you have a different electoral system, so uh, 
while you have different wings in the Labour Party here, you have different parties in the Netherlands. So the Socialist Party is to the left of the, of the Labour Party, and you have this guy, Jan Rijnissen, and he was really a charismatic figure, someone that a lot of people uh, believed in, especially directly after the fall of the wall, to see a new Socialist Party to rise. It was one of the strongest left reformist parties. It was amazing. And in 2006, they had a great electoral victory. They didn't get into government, but they had this moment, momentum where uh, everyone believed that it was possible to change things. But since then, this was 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, uh, the Socialist Party had 50,000 members. They've lost one third of those in the last 12 years. They've gone from 25 seats to 14 now. They've lost uh, the initiative when it comes to the opposition. They were the main opposition party in the 90s and in the early zeros. Uh, they've been completely eclipsed by Wilders in this, uh, in this sense. And what happened was not that there were not enough people knocking on doors or uh, that not enough people were behind it. The problem was the dynamics of left reformism. The Socialist Party had to compromise all the time. They had to give in, and because of that, they became something that did not embody the alternative that a lot of people believed in. And uh, while the victory of the Socialist Party in 2006 was enormously important, it was a huge victory for the whole of the left, the real problem was that the leftist movement was not building uh, their own struggles the outside of the parliamentary uh, struggle. And I think Mark Thomas was quite right when he talked about the balance between parliamentarian work and work outside of parliament. It always has to do with where do you lie your emphasis. And I think it's, uh, the Socialist Party had this slogan saying, no fraction without action. But they always put the fraction first, and I think that's one of the problems that led to the disaster now. Okay, can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm worried about the spectacle of what's going on in Labour-dominated councils or council, where places like where I live, Bristol, where we have a Labour mayor, we have um, a black... Can't hear you. Can't you can't hear me. hear me? Is that better? I'm speaking to the top of it. Top of it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just... Start again. I'm worried about the spectacle that we see in places like where I live in Bristol, where we have um, a Labour mayor, a black Labour mayor, we have a majority of Labour councillors, and uh, they're not resisting the cuts. In fact, they're putting through the most terrible cuts we've ever seen. And it's appalling to see the suffering that is resulting. You know, the, the loss of parks and playgrounds and libraries is familiar to us all. The, the terrible cuts for disabled people and children and, and, and elderly care and so on. And what we need, of course, is um, a no-cuts budget to be set. And um, they, they absolutely will not do it. And momentum, I went to a momentum meeting and they didn't even want to debate it. And we had a march of 10,000 people in Bristol uh, demanding no, uh, that the cuts didn't go through. And that should have emboldened them, but it doesn't. It doesn't. And I, I had a chat with the mayor on that march and I said, are you not going to set a no-cuts budget? And, uh, and he said, well, what about, you know, if the government sends in commissioners and they impose cuts? I said, well, let them. At least it's not, at least it's not Labour doing it because you are losing votes. You are going to lose votes for Labour, and I think we saw that in the council election results this year. The effect this has, it utterly disillusions people, it really does. So, you know, it would be much better if, if we did give Theresa May a big headache and have councils, Labour councils up and down the country saying, no, no cuts budgets, and that's what we should demand, but Corbyn won't do it. Because when I cornered the mayor and said, why won't you do it, he said, let Corbyn tell me to do it, and then I will. And he knows he is safe. He knows that isn't going to happen. It's a very unedifying spectacle to see people uh, on picket lines against their employer and their employer is a Labour council. 
And that's not the only uh, disillusioning thing we see. I think we need socialists who are outside the Labour Party to explain why um, Jeremy Corbyn, if he is made Prime Minister, is going to be stopped from doing a lot of the things he wants to do by business leaders, by members of his own side. We're going to need people who can explain why capitalism cannot accommodate, actually, a different way of running the economy when it's in crisis. It cannot be run in a way that doesn't penalise the many for the benefit of the few. And if it can, I'd like to hear a lot more than we're hearing from Corbyn and MacDonald about how they're going to do it. And I just want to finish by saying that uh, my own children uh, are among the very many young people who joined the tide of people joining Labour to back Corbyn. You know, and of course I was out there saying vote Corbyn myself. Uh, a lot of a lot of SWP members were. Um, and who are now very, very disillusioned by the lack of radicalism that they're seeing, by the failure to challenge these council leaders, the failure to challenge the cuts, the failure to challenge trade union leaders who won't lead struggles, and the failure to get out there, take a high profile, and really offer proper change. Three minutes, yeah? Um, does the SWP get it that something has changed? Yes. Uh, look around the room. The poster with May's head on it is one of the ones we had at the last general election, and we haven't put it away since. Uh, back Corbyn is the bottom line on it. Now, I assure you we did not have one that said Back Miliband, Back Brown, uh, Back Blair, <laughs> or Callaghan, or the rest of them. I could go back a long way. Uh, we recognise something important happened. And of course, we all campaigned at the last election, and we will at the next one, for a Labour vote, even with the most shitty, awful right-wing Blairite candidates, because we recognise the importance of it. That's axiomatic, self-evident, it should be clear. Second question, though, is I disagree with Mark Perryman that there were these elections which were transformative. And I'll take one example, that of the 1979 election. First of all, 1979 didn't begin in 1979, it began in 1976, when uh, the Labour government, Callaghan, Dennis Healy, put forth, forward the cuts of the IMF to implement neoliberalism and austerity. Uh, Thatcher built on that. I'm not saying the election didn't matter, but it already began before that. And then, even when Thatcher was in, it is not true that they acted like a steamroller over the British working class movement. It was not really until 1984-85 and the defeat of the miners that you really see the letting rip of the Thatcherite assault. And what you learn from that is, of course, elections matter, which is one of the reasons we want to be supporting Labour at the next general election, and why, by the way, unlike some others, we don't stand against Labour at the moment in elections. But what really matters is the question of class struggle. And this matters because it refers back again to how uh, you place your resources. And to my very good friend Judy Cox, who spoke earlier, uh, Judy knows, because she used to do the meetings, uh, the biggest increase in workers' wages in Britain was 1970 to 74 because of the level of struggle under the Heath government. And the biggest cut before the latest uh, austerity offensive was in the Labour government of 74 to 79. And you learn the same lesson. And the problem is this. It may seem very tough to be a revival of workers' struggle, but if there is not, we will find it very, very hard to get even the minimal reforms that Corbyn has spoken about, and to defeat the inevitable resistance of the bosses and the bankers and the European Union and the financial system. And that's why, not because we don't want to see change, not because we don't want to see Corbyn in Downing Street, we desperately do, our attention remains on building struggles in the streets and the workplace as the absolute primary requirement and on building an independent revolutionary organisation. Yeah, Mark Perryman describes the choice that we have to make as a choice between our resources as a left 
was either being part of a kind of placarding army or being part of a canvassing army. And I think that's kind of dismissive of a whole wave of activity because Mark himself says that demonstrations can be transformative. I admit that some demonstrations aren't transformative, <laughs> but on occasions, demonstrations can be transformative. Of course, you know, the Rock Against Racism movement was such, and he mentioned Stop the War. There are other times when demonstrations are transformative. I think the question of whether we can muster enough people on Sunday to oppose Tommy Robinson supporters in London is going to be crucial. I think whether we can muster enough people to put up, uh, to show that there is serious resistance to the growth of the far right will in some way determine the future. And I don't believe that anyone who puts all their effort in leafleting tube stations, going round Labour Party members to try and get them to sign the statement, doing stalls in their town centre, is wasting their time. And I'm sure Mark doesn't look, believe that they're wasting their time either. But it won't be wasting their time either in a period of an election if there are other struggles of a similar nature going on if people choose to use their energy in that way. And so what I'm saying is that we have to look, I'm not oblivious to the role that Corbyn can have in the fight against racism. When Corbyn was first elected and made his first act as the new Labour minister, appearing on the platform of the pro-refugee demonstration, what an enormous space that created for all of us all of us who've been fighting over refugee rights, uh, it created enormous confidence and wave of space for us to, to act. I think we have to do that. Again, I, what I would really relish is the idea of all those people who've become part of the Corbyn movement to be on the streets with us on the Sunday. Sadly, I think far too many of them now think the primary objective is the election and everything must be subordinated to the election. The tragedy of that is that demonstrations that really are crucial are not being built in quite the way that they ought to have been built in. Right. Um, OK, I, I'll try to answer as many as possible. I mean, I think the point about Haringey, fantastic victory for the Labour left in Haringey, no question about it. For those of you seen that astonishing documentary about local council housing, dispossession, every single one of the councils featured selling off the houses are Labour councils. There's a terrible development going on, being bitterly resisted by the community, Elephant and Castle, at the moment. The Ward Labour Party responsible for Elephant and Castle, passed a motion unanimously opposing that development, and the right-wing Labour MP there described this as bullying. OK, so yes, there's a huge struggle to go on within the Labour Party. In terms of what you can do when you ain't got any money, there's a fantastic quote from Lindsay Hanley, who's a great writer on council housing in, in, in my book, where politics fails, cynicism reigns. And what we can say is the populist right rises. And the only way to negate that cynicism is to treat politics first as a local endeavour. The challenge for Corbynites, Corbynistas, whatever you like, is to go local. And that means campaigning and changing your local communities as well as winning council seats. Uh, I don't know whether this is an insult, but there's something very in common between a mainly SWP audience and a mainly Labour Party audience when I speak. You all want a general election earlier than the 2022. It's the same for a Labour Party audience, it's the same for a Marxism audience. I think we need to face a few realities. However active we are, however big the demonstrations are, whatever the upsurge from the subterranean to the upturn in terms of industrial struggle, we've got a number of problems. The DUP's worst nightmare is a, is a Prime Minister with a smidgen, a smidgen of commitment to a united Ireland. Let's be clear, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell have more than a smidgen of a commitment to united Ireland. They are not going to desert May. Tory rebels, now there's an oxymoron if you need one. You know, they, don't, they couldn't spell the word rebellion. Okay? Whether it's Brexiteers or Remainers, they will not condemn their party to being out of power for a generation. So forget about the Tory MPs reducing her majority. So it's extremely... So it, apart from the extra parliamentary upsurge, my challenge to you would be, under what circumstances would there be a general election before 2022? Whatever the leader, whether it's May or anybody ever, no Tory is going to be so stupid to call an early general election. 
John Molyneux raised a difficult point, I think. Has Corbyn gone silent over the last few months? Well, I would broaden it way beyond simply next Friday's and next Saturday's demonstrations. I think I used to be lectured by uh, SWP comrades when I was a student, they, and they used to use it, I mean, lectured in a political way, not being turned to talk by them. And they used to say, Mark, you can't turn the tap on and off, a struggle. You can't turn it on and then turn it off and turn it on and then turn it off. It's constant. The, con the struggle is continuous. And I think the problem is, it's those enormous rallies around the Labour Party and around Corbyn during the they needed to continue, not to stop, just because the election campaign was over. I went to one uh, just after the election in Hastings, and I come back to Hastings and Rye when you tell me I've got to wind up. And it was to launch the Unseats campaign. The Hastings and Rye seat is Amber Rudd's, and she's got a majority of 396. And it was huge, but there's not been another one since. And you need to maintain, to uh, use a pun, the momentum. Do I think it's the most important thing that he addresses the demonstration on Friday? I've got to be perfectly honest, no. What's far more important is that Jeremy Corbyn will never, ever hold hands with Donald Trump. He will condemn every policy that Trump introduces. If he is elected uh, Prime Minister and Trump were unfortunate enough to have him and still as the President of the United States, you will never have seen a relationship with the United States like it before. Okay, so um, I just want very, very quickly just address a couple of others. Is one of the chapters in this book describes the way the Labour Party membership has changed. I think. And I don't know whether the other Labour members who are here today would agree with this. So the, the, the researcher Jess Garland used the phrase, a multi-speed party. And what she means by that is when you pick up a Labour Party membership card on Jeremy Corbyn being elected leader, does it sum up my entire political identity? No. Will I remain a, 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 a Labour Party member if he's chucked out? No. Does it mean I've forgotten all the things I learned through extra-parliamentary activity before? No. OK, it's a much, much looser relationship to the Labour Party. And I want to finish with Hastings and Rye. I live in Lewis in East Sussex. Hastings and Rye is about half an hour on the train. And I would still say, and I, I'm glad to hear what you said about the activity of the SWP, that you can assure us that you will provide the Labour Party in those four or five or six weeks of that crucial campaign in 2022. Amber Rudd, the pioneer of the hostile environment has a majority of 346. Those five or six weeks will decide. The activity on the doorstep will decide whether we boot her out. She's the number seventh target. She's getting Amber Rudd out doesn't guarantee you a Labour government. But you're around about a third of the way there towards being Labour being the majority government. I do think that will be a historic election. It may not be, I, on the scale of importance of change, I'm sure we would disagree, you know, because the mo most of you are revolutionary socialists, so this is just simply a parliamentary change. But it will be a change far, far greater than Blair becoming Prime Minister, or if Kinnock had become Prime Minister, or John Smith had become Prime Minister. So I do think we need to recognise this is a historic opportunity. <laughs> Uh, Mark began the, um, uh, his introduction saying that uh, there was no point in having a recruit the speaker type meeting. Fair enough. However, um, there are people uh, in the Labour Party in the room who I, I don't know, so I'd like to try my luck and try to recruit you. And, and I'd like to thank Mark for getting you to all to identify yourselves so we can really hone this on the Now, um, Mark said that, you know... Don't put your hands up again. <laughs> <laughs> Sneak out the back. Yeah. Uh, Mark said that, look, you know, you, we're revolutionary socialists. Jeremy Corbyn, and he's absolutely right, has never said he's a revolutionary. Absolutely true, and you, you can't judge him by that criteria. Actually, I hope that I wasn't. What I was trying to say is, judging Jeremy and the movement around him, more importantly, on its own terms, can it deliver on those reforms, if you like. And I was trying to point both to the urgent task we have now, long before the question of a Corbyn government becomes a reality, but also the huge obstacles it faces. I mean, look, if, if you, you know, I talked about Syriza earlier. My criticism of Syriza is not that they failed to organise a socialist revolution and an insurrection. To be fair, they never said they would. My criticism of Syriza is that they were unable 
to implement their own programme of reform. In other words, they failed on their own terms. And I think the, what Mark was perhaps uh, weakest on, a bit silent on, is the fact that, you know, when he says that uh, uh, get Corbyn elected, it would be at least a break from, might not be a revolution, but at least a break from the neoliberal thing. Well, Mark, a Corbyn government may try to break from the neoliberal order, but will it be successful? And I think, to be honest, there will be fierce fierce resistance to try to break a Corbyn government, if necessary, to drive it from office, but certainly to demoralise its supporters and limit the effect uh, of those refer, uh, reforms. In other words, the future will not end when Corbyn is waving in number 10. The hardest bit will actually be after that, and, and the key there will not be constantly referring back to the democratic mandate. It's whether this difficult task of lifting the level of resistance is successful or not. This will be uh, determinative. Now, um, Mark talked about shifting balance between, you know, door knocking and placarding, demonstrating and so on. The argument here is not that one should never combine parliamentary activity and extra parliamentary. And for God's sake, the Bolsheviks used to stand candidates successfully for the um, fake parliament of the Duma. Um, I'll let you into a secret. We, we will have a meeting of uh, our sister organisations and fellow thinkers uh, from across Europe and the world uh, going by the last few years evidence that there will be several MPs in that room. We're not against this. But I'll tell you what you have to be clear about is one is always subordinate to the other because they're not equal. And the pull on working people of thinking change can come simply by changing who is in the government. Working class people grow up in a world where they feel relatively powerless, lack control. They want change. How do you get that? Come on, do it through the existing institutions. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? Isn't that legitimate? And all it requires you to do is vote and persuade other people to vote. Our message is to say, however useful that can be in giving people more confidence and getting voices up there and so on, real change will only come through a harder road of collective struggle by working people. And we have to be absolutely honest and clear about that and do everything we can to increase it. I think Mark is... What I appreciate about Mark is he's completely honest. He says the priority is to go out uh, on the door knocker. I'll tell you what, we don't need more people. Labour's got 550,000. How many more does it need to go out on the knocker? I think Labour cannot simply rely on canvassing its way to victory. I think the more sense of class feeling in society, including in an election campaign, the more prospect of Labour getting elected. So it's true that the SWP will throw itself in calling for a Labour government. We'll not be canvassing. Um, you know, there's that terrible Liam Neeson thing where he talks about how he's a special set of skills, you know. I'll tell you what the SNP's special set of skills is. Stoking up class anger and anti-Tory feeling in the cities and, and towns of Britain. That's what we'll be doing in the general election, and I think that will help <laughs> Corbyn, actually. Um, just, just to end on a couple of points. You see, I think when Mark says, look, parliamentary and electoral activity and extra parliamentary and strikes and so on, not hermetic. This is absolutely true, and it's a welcome development. The fact that when you go to picket lines, you meet Labour MPs, you meet Momentum supporters, and so on, is, is, is a very, very important development. Just ask you this question. When I go to picket lines, I often find Labour Party supporters now in a way that I didn't in the past. I often find there's as many Labour Party members as SWP members. But I'll say, the Labour Party is 100 times bigger than the SWP. Often it's the same numbers. Why is that? Because for Labour... It's something that some members support. Not all. Sometimes it's Labour Party councils putting through the cuts and so on. In other words, it's an additional thing to the priority that Mark has very clearly outlined of elections. For the SWP, it's our whole raison d'etre. Our whole raison d'etre is and not just to visit the picket line, but to do what we can to initiate picket lines, to organise, to get people into meetings, to build solidarity, to, do collect, to maximise the chance of a successful struggle, to try and lift the level of struggle. Therefore, I appeal to anyone who wants to be in an organisation whose systematic purpose is to organise and fight for the maximum unity and the maximum level of working class struggle to join the SWP.